Hi, Tom Waybright here. We're looking at the third and fourth chapters of the book of Esther, so I'm glad you've joined me. Uh, so let's get right into it. When we look at this portion of the book, uh, first of all, we're introduced to the villain of our story, and he is called Haman, and he is the enemy of the Savior uh, on the spiritual side, and he is an enemy of the people of God. We also see this condition of anti-Semitism, which rears its ugly head in our story. Anti-Semitism is a condition in all Gentile uh, nations. It's a condition that is generally endemic, uh, but dormant, meaning it's always there, but it's not always in the forefront. But occasionally, when this endemic condition becomes epidemic, we have a holocaust we have an attempt to exterminate the Jews from the earth. And we see that in uh, the beginnings of that in our uh, study today. That condition which is endemic and which becomes epidemic at times, the Bible teaches will one day be pandemic. That is, there will be a global holocaust uh, wherein the world is trying to rid itself of the Jews. And that comes just prior to our Lord's return. Now, the third thing that we see when we look at this portion of Esther is the genesis of what became a traditional annual feast for the Jews called the Feast of Purim. The Feast of Purim is a time when the Jews get together and they read the book of Esther and they dress up in different costumes. And as they read the book, every time the name Mordecai is read, the people cheer. And every time the name Haman is read, the people jeer and hiss and boo at the enemy. So let's get into the scripture now, reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. After these events, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes who were with him. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why are you transgressing the king's command? Now it was when they had spoken daily to him, and he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai neither bowed down nor paid homage to him, Haman was filled with rage. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him who the people of Mordecai were. Therefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, who were throughout the whole kingdom, of Ahasuerus. So we're introduced here to Haman, who is an Agagite. Now this identifies him with the people of Amalek. Now the people of Amalek were notoriously enemies of the Jews going all the way back to the time of their wilderness journey and before. They are descendants of Esau. So this ancestry comes as no surprise. Now the king had said that when Haman came into the presence of those who were at the gate, that they should bow down to him to pay homage to him. Now, why Haman was promoted to this position, we don't know. But the king said, this is how you honor the position. And the people did it. That is all but Mordecai, who refused to bow down to Haman. And his peers wondered, why is it that you're not bowing down to Haman? Why are you transgressing the law? And the only reason that he would give was because he was a Jew. Now, there's some question as to whether or not bowing down to Haman would have been some sort of violation of, of his relationship with God. Would it have been idolatry for him just to do as the king commanded in paying homage or recognizing the position of Haman? And... Uh, it doesn't seem like that it was. It seemed like just what you would do when, if, a, if any king or queen went by or anyone they deemed important. You would do something to demonstrate some respect to him. But Mordecai would not do it. Whether or not it was stubbornness or whether he felt a conviction to do that, he would not bow down to the man Haman. 
and he said that it was because he was a Jew. Well, his peers didn't understand that that was a legitimate reason, so they actually went straight to Haman and said, you know, Mordecai doesn't bow down to you. And Haman hadn't noticed, but when it had been brought to his attention, well, he certainly noticed then, and he was infuriated that this particular man would not bow down to him. And why would he become infuriated? Well, I think it was pride. He was proud of his position and proud of uh, the honor that was bestowed upon him by the king, and he felt like he deserved that. But when he found out that Mordecai was a Jew, the pride became prejudice, and uh, he was all the more infuriated and decided that the best way to deal with that would be to get rid of the Jews altogether. Let's rid the world of the Jews. And that was his plan. Now, Haman was a man who liked to throw dice. And so he would throw the dice, which in the Bible are called Purim. And uh, it was determined through his throwing of the dice and the casting of lots that it would be the 13th day of the 12th month, the month Adar, that the Jews should be exterminated. And he went to the king with a plan. And he said to the king, now there's a people group in your kingdom. They have their own law. Well, that was true. And they don't obey your laws, which for the most part was untrue. They did obey the laws. It was Mordecai alone who refused to bow down to Haman. But as to the other laws of the land, you would have to obey them in order to get by. And so Haman mixed the truth and the lie to the king and uh, that is often the way it goes, the truth mixed with a lie, so that it seems right when in fact it's wrong. He said, there's a group that doesn't obey your law, and it would be better for you if they were exterminated altogether, because who's to say they wouldn't stir up trouble? He said to the king, now I have a plan, I'll pay for the plan, and the result of the plan is that lots of money will be given to the treasury. And that's all the king needed to hear. He said, here's my signet ring. You write the law, sign it with the ring, and we'll put it into play. And that's what happened. He didn't ask any questions. He didn't say, well, who are these people? He didn't say, well, what exactly are they doing? He heard, I'll pay for it, lots of money coming back in. And that was good enough for Ahasuerus to let Haman write this wicked law. Now, Esther has been queen now for about five years, and still no one knows that she is a Jewess. It has not been revealed. Now, even if the king knew she was a Jew, he didn't know what people group were being annihilated. This is how Haman wrote the law. He said they are to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. And if there's any doubt as to what we want happening to the Jews, destroyed, killed and annihilated, wiped off the face of the earth, and that's what they wanted. But the king didn't ask the questions. It was the 13th day of the first month that the decree was issued, that on the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jews should be killed. So there is an 11-month countdown to the time the Jews would die. Now why? Why are we given that much warning? Well, I think the, the main reason is because God has a plan. He's going to work out a plan to deal with this decree. And that 11-month time period is part of his plan. So letters are sent by couriers uh, all around. They're pressed by the king. And the Bible says that while King Ahasuerus and Haman drank, the people of Susa were confused. Now, why do you think that is? Well, suppose that you turned on uh, the evening news and you hear uh, the president saying, I've issued an order, an executive order, that all of the Muslims in America are to be rounded up and, and killed. Or suppose he said, we're going to round up all of those people who are uneducated or undereducated or mentally challenged or otherwise handicapped and uh, we're going to round them up and have them killed. We're no longer going to have to deal with that. Well, certainly that would be reason for you to be confused because if 
the president or an executive can say, we're going to have this happen to this people group, who's to say that your people group wouldn't be next in line to go? So all of the people, the Bible says, in the area of Susa were confused. How valuable is a human life? Not very valuable to Haman, not very valuable to King Ahasuerus. The king is unaware that his queen must die as a result of the decree that he essentially has made by giving his signet ring to the wicked and evil Haman. When Mordecai learned of the plot, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes. Now that was a common and traditional expression of grief for the Jew. You know, we don't think of it this way, but clothes were actually a very valuable commodity in that day and in the days prior to that. You remember that uh, there was a time when Elisha healed a leper by the name of Naaman. And Naaman wanted to pay for those services, and he offered silver and two changes of clothes as the payment for his healing. And Elisha said, no, you don't have to pay for it. Well, Elisha had a little sneaky servant named Gehazi who ran after Naaman and made up a story about why he needed those clothes and that silver. So clothes were valuable, and the fact that the Jew would tear his clothes and put on sackcloth was a sort of dramatic expression of grief and sorrow. That's why Mordecai has torn his clothes. He's put on sackcloth, and he makes his way up to the gate at the citadel of Susa, but he cannot go in or pass the gate because the law did not allow you to pass the gate wearing sackcloth. That kind of weeping and wailing and mourning and fasting, in fact, could be seen all over the provinces of Persia where the Jews lived because they're reading this decree as it's being delivered and seeing what's coming their way in 11 short months. Well, Esther learned that Mordecai was wailing at the gate and uh, she wondered why. She writhed in anguish, the Bible says, at the fact that her father figure, Mordecai, was in such grief and sorrow. And so she sent a change of clothes out to him so that he could enter the gate, but he refused them. Now, she's unaware of Haman's plan. The decree has not been issued within the confines of the palace, only outside and throughout the kingdom. So she sends a man by the name of Hathak out to find out from Mordecai what in fact is going on. And Mordecai had found out the details of this decree. In fact, he even knew how much money Haman had planned to spend in order to have this come about, the killing of the Jews. So he revealed that detail to Hathak gave him a copy of the decree to take back to Esther and gave him an order for her. Now, an order for the queen, mind you, coming from just a man who works at the gate, orders her to do something about it relative to speaking to the king that he might stand up for her people. Now, remember, this is the man who said, keep your ancestry and your ethnicity a secret. Don't tell anyone that you are a Jew. But now he says, you must be an advocate before the king for the people, the Jewish people. Now, she says, in return, there's a problem with that. You see, you remember the law of the Medes and the Persians, which says once a law is decreed, it can't be changed. Well, she says, you know, the king really has only one law that he lives by when he's on the throne, and that is you can't come into his presence unless he summons you there. And I haven't been summoned to the king. In fact, I haven't even spoken with the king or seen him in 30 days. And the only way I could come into him, his presence is if he would just by his own grace and mercy extend the golden scepter and allow me to come in uninvited. You know, you can't go to God on your own. You could never go to his throne room on your own based on your own efforts. The fact that you walk into his presence in your sinful condition would put you in a place of total death 
destruction and annihilation right on the spot. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God, by his grace, sent his son Jesus Christ. He lowered the scepter, the golden scepter of his grace, and sent his son to pay a price for our sin condition. He lived a perfect life and he died to pay the price for our sins and he rose again and he lives to make intercession for us. He is our high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession of him. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He's been touched by the feelings of our infirmities. He feels our feelings. Yet he's done all of this without sin. Therefore, we are to come boldly to the throne of grace, to find mercy, to find grace for help just when we need it most. You know, Esther didn't have those promises with Ahasuerus. She didn't know that if she came into his presence uninvited, if he would lower that scepter and accept her. So she sent back to Mordecai, I can't do it. Hathak said, she can't do it, Mordecai. She's too afraid to take her own life in her hands. Let's read the scripture and see ex just exactly how Mordecai responds to her resistance to going into the king to advocate for the Jews. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. So Mordecai really tells her three things. He says, first of all, you will not escape just because you're the queen. Haman is evil. He will find out. And when he finds out that you are a Jew, he's not going to let you live. All the Jews he wants dead. Secondly, God is not going to fail in his promises. He's not going to let us be destroyed. But if you don't do anything about it, someone else will. And you and your father's house will be destroyed along the way. And the third thing is, it is not an accident that you are here in this position at this time. You have become royalty for such a time as this. God has planned it all along for you to be in this place to do the things necessary to save his people. So Esther got that message and she said, assemble all the Jews of the area of Susa and fast for three days and nights. My maids and I will do the same thing. And at the end of three days fast, I will go into the king uninvited. If I die, I die. And Mordecai received her reply and did just as she commanded. Well, it's interesting here when we consider the spiritual representation of our characters. Remember, Mordecai represents the Savior. He has found out the, the problem with the king and knew that his life was in danger and he did the things necessary to provide salvation. Esther represents the one who loves and knows the Savior and talks about the Savior. She went to the king earlier and said, you're in danger, your life's in danger, and Mordecai has done the things necessary to save you. The thing was investigated and the, those who were going to hurt the king were punished and in fact executed. But Haman now represents the evil one who hates the Savior and the people of the Savior. You know, it's just like the devil, isn't it? When you've gone to someone to tell them about the Savior, to let them know that their spiritual life is lost and is in danger, and you tell them what Jesus Christ has done for them, 
It doesn't take long for the devil to show up and start doing the things to put doubt in that person's mind and to make them want to turn away from the truth, mixing the truth with lies so that it becomes difficult for you to tell the difference between the true gospel and a gospel that is mixed with works and effort. And that's the devil's gospel, that salvation comes from works. When the truth of the gospel is that salvation is by faith in Christ alone, so that's our spiritual representation. The devil wants God's people annihilated. He doesn't want any more of God's people made through conversion. So he'll do everything he can to come right in and stand between you, the one who loves the Savior and talks about the Savior, and those who need the Savior. He'll always come and cast doubt upon the truth of the Savior and his gospel. Do we have any spiritual application from these verses and these chapters? Certainly we do. First of all, we need to realize that human life is valuable. God loves human life. In fact, he created human life and he sent his son to die for all human life that they might be redeemed and bought back to him. So we must share this good news of Christ with all people. The second thing is that it's time to actually stand up and take a stand for Christ uh, to say, I'm his, therefore I'm not going to do this particular thing anymore. Or I'm his, and therefore I'm going to start doing this thing that he wants me to do going forward. Take the stand. You see, God had to deal in Esther's rebellious heart. The whole time she was saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, she was in rebellion. And there was no way that God was going to end up dealing, eventually in the life of Ahasuerus on the spiritual side, until the witness got her heart right with him. The same is true for you. You may know someone who you've been thinking about, even praying about, becoming saved. And God hasn't done anything in their life. And perhaps God is working on your, your heart, something in your heart. What area of rebellion is in your heart that is preventing you from being the effective witness you need to be? So take the stand for Christ. Do the things he wants you to do relative to sharing the gospel. Realize this also, that your actions have far-reaching consequences. Let's suppose that Mordecai's actions in not bowing down to Haman were a result of his own pride and his stubbornness. If that's the case, then there are certainly far-reaching consequences to that action. But whether or not that's the case with Mordecai, it's the case with you, it's the case with me. We do things out of pride and out of stubbornness that have far-reaching consequences that negatively affect our witness for Christ. So remember uh, that your actions, no matter how small you think they are, have far-reaching consequences. Remember again that God has put you where you are for a reason, that you may be where you are for such a time as this. How is he going to use you where you are? Are you seeking that will? And then the last application is trust God in the bad times. Trust him in the bad times because his promises never fail. His promises always come to pass. He's too wise to be mistaken. He's too good to be unkind. He's too powerful to be thwarted. So trust in him even in the bad times. And failure to do so is in fact rebellion. And you'll have to get your heart right with him before he can use you where you are. In our next lesson, we're going to look at chapters 5 and 6. So I hope you come back for that. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.